Wars, both real and metaphorical, permeate Franz Liszt's life and works. Born in 1811 at the height of the Napoleonic Wars, Liszt was directly impacted by the revolutions of 1830 and 1848 and lived to see the effects of the Italian Wars of Unification and the Franco-Prussian War. Concurrently, Liszt's virtuosity and string-breaking exploits earned him the nickname the Napoleon of the Piano. And he was, of course, a central figure, perhaps the central figure in the War of the Romantics. Given such political and artistic volatility, it is not surprising to find military topics in the form of marches, fanfares, and cavalry charges, what I consider a subset of the noble horse topic, as discussed in Raymond Monell's 2000 book, The Sense of Music, as touchstones of Liszt's compositional output. It is on the last of these topics, cavalry charges, I'd like to focus since they serve as the most telling locus of the nature of warfare in the 19th century and of Liszt's evolving views on the subject. I argue that Liszt's sustained exploration of galloping signifiers transcends the surface appeal of the topic's visceral excitement and rather reveals an increasingly critical view of war. I will focus on three watershed pieces written in respectively 1837, 1849, and 1856. Lyon, from the uh, piano cycle album du Voyageur, Funerailles from the piano cycle Harmonie Poetique et Religieuse, and the symphonic poem Hunenschlacht, Battle of the Huns. Each of these pieces implicitly or explicitly references uh, actual armed conflicts, the Lyon Silk Worker Rebellions of 1831 and 1834, the Hungarian Revolution of 1848-49, and the Battle of Chalon of 451 and collectively map a trajectory from youthful enthusiasm for revolutionary causes through disillusionment in the after aftermath of their failure to a sober outlook. I will begin by rooting Liszt's interest in charges in the cavalry's unique status among the military branches of 19th century Europe, citing the writings of Napoleon, Karl von Clausewitz, and modern military historians. I argue that Liszt's cavalry charges, while often signifying the chivalric past, also reflect the cavalry's status as the most likely locus of hand-to-hand -hand combat. Next, I will situate Lyon within the broader radical progressivism that defined Liszt's artistic and political activities in 1830s Paris. In contrast, Funerai represents a retreat from Liszt's earlier optimism about the fruitfulness of rebellion, tipping the scales from defiance to resignation. Hunnenschlacht marks Liszt's withdrawal from overt political commentary. Henceforth, his invocation of military topics would be safely confined to the realms of myth and metaphor. The prevailing view of cavalry charges in the long 19th century is one of gradual obsolescence, with artillery and powerful small arms emerging as the most devastating forces on the battlefield. However, cavalry in this time was still a force to be reckoned with as evidenced by the writings of Napoleon and Karl von Clausewitz, the Prussian military theorist who's on war, largely informed by his own experiences in the Napoleonic Wars, remains the defining military text of the century. In his writings, Napoleon, Acknowledges, oh, thank you very much. I didn't realize I was gonna get through. Uh, thank you, Lydia. Uh, I think we just have to press the right. Yeah, um, I think that's fine. There we go. Um, sorry. In his writings, Napoleon acknowledges the diminished numbers of cavalry since the 17th century. Uh, I don't have that quote up there. That's all right, I'll just read it. The armies of the time were at least, uh, to quote Napoleon, the armies of the time were at least half made up of cavalry. They had little artillery, one and a half pieces per thousand men. Today, an army is four fifths infantry, a fifth at most cavalry, and has four artillery pieces per thousand men. Nevertheless, Napoleon considered cavalry to be critical to the success of an army, especially due to its offensive capabilities. For instance, Napoleon credits an important early victory in his Italian campaign to a decisive cavalry charge. And here's this quote here. At Arcola, I won the battle with 25 cavalrymen. I sent them on the enemy's flanks with three trumpets that sounded the charge. A general cry was heard in the Austrian ranks. The French cavalry are coming, and they took to their heels. It is true that one must seize the moment. Napoleon concludes, of the three arms, cavalry, infantry, and artillery, none is to be disdained. All are equally important. Uh, yeah, thank you. Clausewitz echoes these views, averring the cavalry's primarily offensive function and noting the profound psychological impact of the cavalry charge, noted, quote, its speed increases chaos and terror. While Clausewitz is often unjustly maligned for his supposed sanctioning of mechanized total war as a viable expression of state policy, the pursuit of politics by other means is how it's often translated, his writings instead reveal a mind shaped by the values of German idealism in which spiritual forces are at play in the theater of war. 
In particular, Clausewitz often refers to the Freispiel des Geistes, the free play of the spirit that prizes individual initiative over mindless collective action. Clausewitz sees the greatest potential for such individual agency in small war or partisan warfare, such as that waged by such irregular troops as the Lutzowsch Freikorps, in which hand-to-hand -hand combat, not strict formation, was the rule. Clausewitz writes, quote, this free play of the spirit that takes place in small war, this skillful combination of boldness and prudence, one might say this fortunate mixture of audacity and fear, is what makes small war so exceptionally interesting. Alluding to Aristotle's definition of courage as the mean between fear and confidence, Clausewitz expresses nostalgia for the mythicized past of the Iliad when, to quote military historian John Keegan, heroes fought heroes. Within the broader context of large war, though, it was the cavalry, especially when pitted against enemy cavalry, that afforded the most opportunities for the heroic display of hand-to-hand -hand combat, generally denied the infantry or artillery whose primary weapons were ranged. As William McNeil thank you, uh, puts it in his 1982 book, The Pursuit of Power, quote, only the cavalry charging home with cold steel preserved the primitive reality of combat. This reinforced the prestige cavalry inherited in European armies from the days of knighthood. Artillerymen with their cold-blooded mathematics seemed subversive of all that made a soldier's life heroic, admirable, worthy. Heroism, decisiveness, dynamism, nobility, these were the qualities widely imputed to cavalry charges and therefore the qualities that likely appealed to Liszt. It is telling then that Liszt chooses to subvert the established order in Lyon a piece written in honor of the silk workers who unsuccessfully revolted in the city, as I said, in 1831-1834. In the score, uh, Liszt quotes the motto of the 1831 rebellion, vivre en travaillant ou mourir en combattant, live working or die fighting. And as his pupil, Jose Viana de Mota, would later point out, this motto, if you can just press the next one, please, um, fits the rhythm of the opening motive. I'm not going to be playing the other examples, but I think I can manage this. Oh, uh, sorry, can you go back a little bit? Uh, a few. A few more. Keep going, please. No, one more. And then one forward. There. Thank you. Uh, So similar to what we discussed this morning about Valley Dobermann and the, the epigraph in that piece. Uh, rising scale, uh, so uh, heroic fanfare, rising major third, and then the binary opposition of the uh, rising scale falling to minus seven. Uh, in the development, the uh, Morir en Combatant part, the second part, forms the basis of a stirring cavalry charge in galloping triplets. And I think I'm now gonna go over to YouTube. We have some technical difficulties. This is Ashley Wass that I've outsourced to. So. I hope you don't blame me for not attempting that. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, of course, it was the military, not the workers, who had cavalry and the nature of the fighting, street to street with troops gradually taking bridges and barricades, precluded true char charges in any case. Rather, the cavalry would have been used, at, per Clausewitz's description, quote, for small unit chases through the streets where people are shooting at each other, end quote. Through the canonic treatment of the die fighting motive uh, that we heard in an ever more chromatically unstable crescendo, List suggests both the ferocity of a battle devolving into hand-to-hand -hand combat and the heroic defiance of the silk workers. Thus, the charge signifies the heroic no nobility of the workers despite its apparent, apparent incongruity, and this accords well with Monel's view of topics as a closed system of sorts. As Alexander Main and Adrian Kaczmarczyk have, have argued both the inapposite and imprudent nature of Lyon in the context of post-1848 Europe, likely resulted in this decision to omit it from uh, his revision of Album du Voyageur into the first volume of Anne de Pelerinage in 1858. In his later letters, this routinely, perhaps somewhat disingenuously, insists he has no interest in politics and expresses tamer views. For example, in an 1860 letter following the death of 
the moderate Hungarian statesman Istvan Széchenyi, List favorably contrasts him with the leader of the 1848 uprising, Lajos Kossuth, who in List's view led Hungary down a, quote, false path. That List included Funerai in Armani Poetique Religieuse, then, is a testament both to its superior artistic qualities and to its more oblique reference to controversial events. The profound disappointments of 1848, most notably the suppression of the Hungarian uprising, in which several of List's friends were killed, had tempered List's revolutionary impulses. Funerai's cavalry charge greatly surpasses that of Lyon in its slow build and evocation of bold, even foolhardy heroism. Here, List combines the military signifiers of fanfare and march with a triplet ostinato charge inspired by the famous octave passage in Chopin's uh, heroic comments. Um, I'll go ahead and play a little bit of that. I'm sure you all know this. And this one was working. And this is Christian Zimmerman. I assume most of you probably know this piece, I would think. So um, now I will just mention uh, in, the, in there's a hymn like nature to this theme in, in which List seems to affirm the righteousness of the Hungarian cause. Um, but one could also hear this curious troping of the military and the sacred as a, a subtle indictment of Kossuth's self-righteous and ultimately self-destructive rhetoric. Um, this charge uh, in, well, whereas the charge on Lyon leads to the grandiose recapitulation of the March theme of that, of that piece, in Funerai, the charge ends abruptly on an inconclusive diminished seventh chord, a quote, sudden cry, as Liszt described it, which also leads to an intensified reprise, but now one of despair. And I'll just play a little bit of that. So you can hear that kind of dead end. Skip ahead to it. <laughs> Well, if I had the score in front of me, I could put it. Well, take my word for it, end of the minute seven chord. I can't remember which one it is, but <laughs> um, soon arrive then, uh, Dakota revisits the cavalry charge, but now it is a ghostly memory distorted through the pedal, uh, use of the pedal, uh, modal mixture, and uh, as with uh, Lyon, frequent use of the augmented uh, triad. Where Lyon ends on a resolute defiant note, Funerai offers a, this false hope of final victory snatched away with a final augmented triad that leads to a frustratingly, I think some even hit her, frustratingly abrupt ending, the hollow fifths of the final chords withholding full harmonic closure. Kind of echoes a little bit what Dr. Hatton said about that, what that feels like to have a, to, to miss the third. Funerai then marks a turning point in subsequent pieces inspired by the 1848 revolutions, such as the symphonic poem Eroid Funeb and Hungaria, are similarly bleak in tone. Instead, List's later cavalry charges typically occur in works inspired by literature, myth, or in the case of Hunnenschlag, mythicized history. For Hunnenschlag, List took his inspiration from, uh, thank you, thanks, Lydia, um, from uh, this painting um, by Wilhelm von Kalbach, depicting the Battle of Chalon of 451, in which combined Roman and Visigoth. Uh, Visigothic forces defeated Attila the Hun. Kalbach depicts a legend in which the ferocity of the battle led to the souls of the slain warriors. 
continuing their fight above the field. So there's Attila on the right and uh, Theodoric, the Visigothic king on the left. Uh, Liszt seized upon the spiritual implications of such a depiction, writing in his preface to the symphonic poem. Uh, next slide, please. Quote, but with that philosophic tendency, which always raises the conception of his genius to a point of nobility, Kalbach saw that in this supreme struggle of Theodoric and Attila, two principles clashed with each other, barbarism and civilization, the past and the future of humanity. In what is Liszt's most sustained cavalry charge, occupying the first half of the 15 minute symphonic poem, the composer contrasts the, and go back maybe to the image, oh, that's okay. Uh, the pale green, oh, one more, sorry, that's <laughs> okay. Yeah, uh, the pale green cadaverous light um, of Attila uh, with the brilliant light, fruitful, benef uh, be beneficent and penetrating emanating from the cross behind Theodoric. And so he, and the, I know we're running short of time. So we have a, a motive that's associated with the, uh, the Huns, which is very, uh, has an augmented second, sounds very orientalist. <laughs> And then ultimately what will emerge is uh, the opening of the plain, chance, plain chant Krups Fidelis. So, which um, I'll cut out a little bit, but you can hear that as perhaps an opening up of this chromatic uh, figure uh, associated with the Huns into something that's diatonic, or even pentatonic, and uh, associated with the, uh, the Christian forces. Um, I'm mindful of time, so uh, I... I hope that you know this piece. I don't know if you do, but, uh, and I did have it queued up, I hope. Is it this one? Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, okay, so I gotta do a little bit. Okay. So I'll just let you, I just want you to hear a little bit of this charge and I'll skip ahead. Some of the same things that you'd hear in uh, Leon in terms of the uh, in, imitative uh, invertible counterpoint suggests hand-to-hand -hand fighting, but I'll just skip ahead to this battle cry is going to do a very typical list thing and go from being in minor to being major. So it's a matter of fact. So you're gonna So you hear these themes gradually emerge and transform. Um, but again, within the context of this really a, a, a spiritual battle, uh, it's a real battle, but it's a mythicized uh, battle. Now, uh, again, I'm going to skip things just to make sure we're, we're on time. Um, and he, you know, that just summarizes again from the preface that that's, and I just want to point out that he does talk about that they emerge hand to hand combat. You kind of hear this intensification happen. So he's, he's definitely thinking in these terms, but um, I'm going to blow through these slides, but they're really kind of showing that, that there's a dark side to cavalry charges in this period, namely that their primary function really in the 19th century was to uh, end battles. So what would basically happen, uh, this quote kind of talks about it at the Battle of Jena, um, where uh, this is Napoleon speaking, and uh, they basically pursued the defeated uh, uh, forces with the cavalry and basically sabered them in the back. And <clears throat> Um, and he talks about this elsewhere in Napoleon's writings. He talks about how in, in ancient conflict, there, you know, there's a lot of hand-to-hand, -hand, whereas in modern conflict, it's, it's uh, infantry in formation and artillery, and only at the end do uh, the cavalry hunt, you know, chase down the retreating army. And that's when a lot of the, cal the casualties are inflicted. All that to say that, you know, the reality, of course, as, as Monella has talked about, the reality of these things is very unheroic. Um, and again, I'm summarizing these quickly. But I, I mentioned John Keegan, he talks about a modern, but even within that, that uh, 19th century realm, there was this idea of a code of conduct, but the Cossacks that uh, Clausewitz observed in the, the Moscow campaign in 1812 behaved in a very brutal fashion. They, they killed unarmed people, they were you know, vicious, uh, horrible atrocities. And I, I make the case that that really aligns well with the Cossacks being kind of a, a 19th century holdover of the pastoral nomadic way of warfare that was waged by the Huns. And this is a, an ancient Roman, uh, Ammianus Marcellinus talks about 
how the Huns waged combat. It was using ranged weapons, bows and arrows, and uh, you know the details are, are not very pretty. There's a lot of barbarism. Now, so I'll just I summarize that briefly. Uh, how much of these details List would have known is open for debate. But what seems clear to me is that List's dysphoric portrayal of the Huns stems not so much from their Oriental otherness, but from their embodiment of war in its purest form. And, and Keegan talks about how really it's when you have this uh, pastoral nomad society that war as an, as an end in itself, that was kind of the core of their, of their social system. Um, so I'll just end with this quote from uh, later in List's life. This is uh, in the midst of the Franco-Prussian War. And I think, it's, I think it summarizes his shift in, from youthful enthusiasm to something more sober. I'll just read it here. Uh, this, he's writing to Caroline Suzanne Wittgenstein, his companion. He says, what a dreadful and heartrending thought that 18th century is of Christianity and a few more centuries of philosophy and of intellectual and moral culture have not delivered Europe from the scourge of war. How much longer are we going to go on cutting one another's throats? When will the precepts of religion and the dreams of humanity succeed in achieving something positive? The Decalogue commands us not to kill. Christian and other philosophers constantly preach goodness, gentleness, and charity. Nevertheless, men kill one another ceaselessly in fury and out of necessity. Suicides, duels, and battles stay in the world with blood, even mankind's justice demands the execution of the highest power, and so on. So such settlements are worlds away from those of the young firebrand who wrote Lyon and mark the culmination of the growing disenchantment with war seen in Funerai and Hanenschlag. They're the words of a composer who, with a few exceptions, would spend his final years primarily writing works of a sacred or reflective character. The battles list waged were increasingly spiritual, far removed from the realm of politics. In his increasingly nuanced cavalry charges, List moves the listener away from the noble lie of the military topic and towards a messier but richer truth. Thank you. Sorry, that was so impressed. <laughs> Tried to get it within the. one question? Can I share the 10 minute deficit here? Perhaps yes. one question about remarks. Uh, this is a really very interesting uh, connection about military topics uh, generally in Europe and uh, culture, very important for culture. But perhaps it would be useful for you uh, to read the list writing because he read about the military and revolution, what is the important for our culture, but uh, also about the powerful of music. Power of music, the emotion that is connected with this revolutionary music, and this is really important for Lyon because there, uh, this is a short paraphrase of the Marseillaise. Yes. So this is really revolutionary military music. Sure. And uh, he he wrote about the Marseillaise and uh, Rakotchenash uh, in his uh, text about the desertist and his. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, he, he explained what is this kind of music sure. for our culture. Yeah. And that is this music very important for our point of view, musical signification. Sure. Because this is the music that signifies something. Yes. That transfer a message. This is one thing. And uh, the other thing, uh, this is his writing about Wagner's opera. Yeah. When he uh, analyzed his opera and his military fragments, oh. uh, which kind of instrumentation, yeah. uh, which kind of tempo, etc. Yeah. etc. Et I think that it would be yeah, yeah. useful for, for you. And uh, concerning uh, the funerary, this is also important that the death of Felix von Michalski, yeah. his very, very yeah. close friend, he died as a yeah. martyr yeah. during the revolution yeah. of 48. And that this is the time uh, when, uh, at least for the first time, right, I against the revolution. Yes. This is not a good means yes. to change the situation of the people. Absolutely. Yeah. And he changed his mind, his uh, his point of view uh, into the revolution and revolution military music. So I think that it yeah, yeah. Well, I, I especially appreciate that because I, I I know the good of such situation. I, I looked at that a lot in my, in my earlier uh, research, but I don't know the log and I as well. So maybe we can chat about uh, if you have specific passages that would be really helpful. Uh, thank you. Good. With that, I think we'll say thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, 
One moment, please. Say. Yes. From the Moscow State Tchaikovsky Conservatory on the dialectics of musical and extra musical sense concerning the phenomenon of Wagnerian painting. This or this? This. Maybe. Um. Uh, having given the concept of absolute music a negative vector of meaning, uh, Richard Wagner not only inspired discussions about the correlation of form and content in music, but also affected masters representing other branches of art who were looking for the ideal of non-mimetic meaning generating strategies in music. Contrary to Hans Lick, according to whom the essence of music doesn't depend on its impact on the listener, Wagner presupposed correspondences of the imminent sense of music with emotions and symbolic representations, as evidenced by the term French critic Theodore de Wiseva was one of the first to correlate the process of signification in Wagner's music and other arts. According to his concept, Wagner constituted Gesamtkunstwerk because he realized that the unity of art forms is necessary for reflecting the diversity of spiritual life. Different arts embody the relation between reality and consciousness from different perspectives. In the case of each art, consciousness offered a special gnosiological mechanism or mode of the signification of reality. Painting did it with the help of visual sensation, la sensation, uh, and um, literature with notion, la notion, and music with uh, emotion. As the last mode was the most refined, so other arts should have assimilated it. In the wake of this vast idea, one can specify music transmits emotions through concrete, rhythm, melodic, timbre, harmonic structures that have a certain spectrum of connotations in romantic European culture and serve both to express emotions and to arouse them in the listener. These structures become clearly readable signs of different feelings and even in Wagner's drums, symbolic extra musical images. The fact that Viseva establishes the properties which different types of arts should possess in order to represent the principle of signification, equivalent to that observed in Wagner's music, and calls these types of art the Wagnerian literature and the Wagnerian painting. Since music is neither conceptual nor mimetic, to approach musical refinement, literature should operate not so much with the meaning of words, but with their phonism and rhythms, and painting with colors and the lines separated from objectivity. Viseva pays particular attention to the Wagnerian painting. Unlike traditional painting, in the Wagnerian painting, the function of feelings in the process of sense making becomes secondary, and the means of expression, color, line, brush stroke, come to the fore and in certain combinations act as correlates of musical motifs, melodies, Terms uh, and chords, uh, coding feelings, and even ideas and notions. According to Viziva, the works of not only Delacroix, Whistler, and Pivi de Chavan, but also unexpectedly Montaigne, Perugino, Leonardo, Rubens, uh, Rembrandt, and uh, Antoine Watteau can be considered as examples of the Wagnerian painting which indicates the understanding of this phenomenon, not as a certain historical peculiarity, but as a complex of essential features of visual art. Due to an art critic, Felix Fillion, Georges Seurat and Paul Signac became interested in Vizevas' work. And Vizeva himself considers the painting of Henri uh, uh, Hantan uh, known for his works on the theme of uh, the ring, the Snibelungen, and uh, other Wagner's uh, well drums. Also, uh, these are lithographs and uh, painting uh, of Fantin Matou. 
And uh, Fantin Matur uh, himself said that uh, he had been seeking to create a visual equivalent to Wagner's music. The search for new ways in painting, inspired by Wagner's spe specifically understood ideas, uh, was extremely diverse. However, it's evident that this search brought even the artist's uh, world's aesthetic views were extremely dissimilar to certain common results and to an uh, original attempt to awaken almost synesthetic experience in a recipient. By what means and by what principles did Eve, each of these artists seek to achieve the musicality of painting as a special inner quality? The first. The color as such, self-valuable, independent of objectivity, becomes the most important means of expression. In the French Romantic tradition, Jean de la Croix was one of the first to speak of the special expressiveness of color and its effect on the subconscious. And Charles Baudelaire uh, characterized colors in de la Croix's paintings through the emotions they express, all that had been even before the Wagnerian wave. And uh, you can see uh, the second sample of uh, the glass uh, attempt uh, to create the compositional rhymes uh, and the color rhymes uh, in the picture, uh, which mm, uh, can uh, uh, force it our perception. So, um, the impact of color upon emotions uh, has become a kind of creative credo of, of Fontaine Latour and, uh, of course, of Vincent van Gogh. David Azio, uh, taking into consideration the words of the artist himself and the statements of Emile Bernard, emphasizes uh, the semantics of the colors Van Gogh used. Red was the color of violence and blood, green indicates uh, deception, and uh, indigo, infinity and metaphysics, and yellow, love, harmony, and joy. Uh, so uh, I show different samples of this. Uh, after reading Camille Benoit's and uh, Camille Belek's books about Wagner, where emotions are esteemed as a phenomenon that needs to be expressed by sounds, Van Gogh discusses the possibility of implementing such a mechanism using colors. The painting, uh, painting uh, does not just transmit to the recipient his emotions caused by color, and does not just try to choose a color equivalent for his experience, but by enhancing of color and juxtaposing on of, of conflicting tones, he incites the spectator to certain feelings. Uh, so, like a listener distinguishes the phonism of accords, uh, which changes in our perception the surrounding harmonies, so color should generate an instant nervous reaction. Uh, the second. The last sample of Van Gogh and uh, a second point. The invention of technique uh, that allow the spectator to capture the illusion of the material movement serves as a method of temporalization of the perception of painting, which turns out to be similar to the perception of a music composition. For example, Adilon Redon um, implies on the the phrases spiritual color, la color manal, and uh, vibrating tone, tone brown, a special combinations of color uh, characteristics. Saturation, intensity, which uh, even if the curtain layer of all, pastel of gouache is not thick, makes the spectator to perceive the color in relation to others on the principle of contrasting and complementary tones as a pulsating and vibrating uh, substance. Uh, the uh, third point. The Wagnerian Gefühls Wegweiser had the ambivalence of transmitting the ideas and feelings. With them, modern uh, researchers correlate semantically dominant expressive means used by painters who have taken into account Wagner's experience. Three, three things can be considered as a correlate to a leitmotiv in painting. They are uh, the first. 
one of the cores uh, replete with semantic meaning, which becomes the starting point for the recipient's gaze and finds compositional parallels in different parts of the canvas. Daniel Trusdal considers local spots used by Emile Bernard in this function. The second, a brush stroke um, with uh, an individualized shape, which is the subject for variant replication um, throughout the entire space of the picture. Um, and the sample uh, is group um, uh, of an uh, unwritten tushs uh, and club by Odilon Redon. The third, the implicit elementary geometric figure, which serves as the basis for the schematic structure of the picture. In this sense, the concept of that motif um, by Peter Berger may be applied to the system of angles and straight lines in Cancun by George Seurat. And the structural configurations repeated in different groups, a circle, a C shaped line, etc., are correlated with the melody configuration of the light motifs of the tetralogy uh, by, um, Michel, uh, by uh, Michel Barr. The associative connection of the visual image of the C shaped line and the uh, melody of um, uh, the corresponding uh, decorative outline can very well create in the recipient's mind experience that are not identical to synthetic by close to them. The completed plastic form arranged within itself and which often, but not all of all this, have an objective meaning, can be considered uh, in the structural uh, architectural aspect as a correlated theme. A theme, therefore, is a layer, larger structure in comparison to a light motif. For example, a system of uh, poses, uh, mental color, and uh, direct overlapping noted in connection with the box of Emil Bernard can be defined as a system of themes, a light motif, and uh, their correlate. If they consider painting as a development process, the concept of theme can be interpreted more broadly as a momentum for the incessant elaboration of the material of the picture. In this sense, the term theme is used by Viziva himself. Uh, analyzing the work of uh, Monsieur Bernard, he uh, defines two coloristic themes, purplish blue and the bright notes of light yellow color. Also, the critic regards the immersion of the themes, which causes the formation of zones with continuous interpretation of shades of the both tones and he calls them the variant codes. The two following principles become the most important in uh, structuring of material and in its discrete development, based on the images of compositional parallels, light motif and its variants, theme and variations. These um, patterns can be seen not only in a single book, but also in a series of paintings all of which that become variations on their chosen motive. For example, according to uh, Ingo Walter and Rainer Metzger, the most important creative principle of Van Gogh was the principle of variation on a theme, which while being always recognizable, had been elaborated in countless ways. So uh, the conclusion. Wagnerian painting presupposes a certain uh, glossological mechanism of reception. First, the spectator uh, receives the initial uh, sensation, a purely visual impression from the harmony and correlation of colors. Then he should actualize uh, cultural memory, knowledge on the context of the picture creation, the artist's intentions uh, to reflect on the received sensation, translate it into notion or an idea that is similar to the extra musical meaning of Wagnerian light motifs and which makes perception psychological by aiding semantic overtones and connotations. And finally, this process generates synthetic emotion. It translates the received sensory and rationalized meanings into the super intellectual area where reflection is overcome and a holistic understanding of the Vox artistic intention is achieved. So, thank you for your attention.
uh, and thank you for that remarkable um, prismatic view that is not art historical, but rather uh, technical and expressive, mm -hmm. quite poetic way of thinking about and seeing mm -hmm. these paintings in terms of their color, the brush strokes, mm -hmm. and how it moves from sensation to notion to emotion. Mm -hmm. That is a very fascinating way of looking out. Could you tell us a little bit more about uh, Vizeva? I'm not familiar with the name. Vizeva. Uh, uh, Teodor de uh, Vizeva uh, was uh, the uh, uh, Polish uh, researcher and art critic. Uh, but uh, uh, he moved to uh, Paris uh, and he was the third. Yes, uh, he uh, was a friend uh, of uh, Edouard Dujardin uh, and um, Henri Fontaine Latour and uh, Vincent Dendy and uh, Ernest Chasson. And uh, uh, he uh, elaborated. Uh, uh, the theory of Wagnerian art um, and uh, in uh, uh, connection with uh, Edouard Dujardin, uh, he created uh, the um, uh, magazine uh, uh, in which uh, he uh, published uh, several articles uh, about uh, new art mm. as he considered it. <laughs> Fascinating. Are there any questions? Um, thank you very much. Very, yeah, as Dr. Hansen, very, very interesting. I mean, I, I've, I've written on lists, interest in, in artists, and as that image I showed you indicates, they were not, his art, he was not on the cutting edge of, uh, of <laughs> art. Whereas, I mean, the, the letters, I, I couldn't keep track of the dates, but I realized the Van Gogh, he's writing after Wagner's death, I think. That was 18, late 1880s, I think. But, but, but then you have this image of Renoir, so I'm just kind of curious how how well did um, Wagner, how much, how aware was he of, of the impact he was having on, on the visual arts and these? Mm -hmm. arts? Mm -hmm. uh, this is the question <laughs> for the future, I think. I mean, clearly he did. I just, I'm just it's interesting to me that he. Yes. <laughs> uh, I mean, yes. It, this uh, suggests that he. I, uh, I think about uh, this problem. Yeah, thank you very much no, for this no, remark. <laughs> and uh, Theodore uh, de Vizeva uh, named um, Theodore Vizevsky when he was born. In Polish, he named Theodore Vizevsky. Yes. And uh, after um, uh, in Polish for Paris, he uh, uh, changed his uh, surname and uh, from Wieszewski to Wieszewa. Oh, yeah. And about what year did he publish this theory? Hmm? What year did he publish the theory? Uh, 1885, uh, 1886, um, in uh, uh, three articles about painting and uh, in two articles about literature. Mm -hmm. Very, very interesting. Thank you so much. Thank you. Great pleasure to introduce Jacques Lebrun, who has been well known to all of you who come to these international conferences on musical signification. Uh, Le conflict des narrativités en Montréal, la signification musicale, à la mise en scène, exemple de Russia, Ruslan, and de Miller, and Gregor, Ruslan and Ludmilla. So the presentation will be in French, but the PowerPoint will have slides in English.
Mm-hmm. Yes, yes. Yes, I will uh, give this paper. I read this paper in uh, French, but uh, I may, of course, uh, answer in English and uh, no problem for that. Well, and uh, my, uh, my communication portera sur l'opéra de Glinka, uh, Roslan et Ludmila. Uh, pourquoi? Eh bien, uh, au début, j'avais pensé faire une étude de la partition et ensuite de la mise en scène, mais aujourd'hui, eh bien, il y a un nouvel éclairage sur cet opéra, car eh bien, il est euh, aujourd'hui devenu un, euh, un enjeu culturel et politique depuis le début de la guerre en Ukraine, puis l'attaque de Russes en Ukraine, et donc, euh, on peut le considérer, bien sûr, comme un, euh, un, euh, un opéra fondamental dans la culture russe, un opéra qui a été à l'origine d'un style national, qui est d'après un poème de euh, Shakespeare, de Pushkin, pardon, le Shakespeare russe, le Shakespeare russe, euh, si je puis dire, l'absurde c'est intéressant. Et euh, ce qui est intéressant, c'est que, euh, bon, il a une importance musicale. Mais c'est un opéra qui, a, qui est situé aujourd'hui dans ce qu'on appelle la ville de Kiev, bien sûr, mais qui était capitale de, non pas l'Ukraine, non pas la Russie, mais ce qu'on appelle la Rousse au Moyen-Âge. C'est-à-dire la Rousse, ce n'est ni la Russie, ni l'Ukraine. C'est un État slave qui a des frontières qui se divisent ensuite, qui est euh, ensuite, euh, qui, est, euh, qui a une histoire assez particulière, qui se divise en, en principautés, et euh, l'une d'entre elles donne euh, lieu à naissance à la principauté de Moscou et au grand euh, duché de Moscou. Et ce qui nous intéresse, c'est qu'aujourd'hui, eh bien, on a un opéra russe qui est situé à Kiev, avec deux interprétations possibles. La première, c'est l'opéra, euh, l'interprétation russe, c'est le symbole de la grande Russie, de la Russie impériale, de euh, l'Ukraine n'existe pas, c'est la Russie. Et de l'autre, eh bien, pour les Ukrainiens, la Russe, c'est déjà l'Ukraine. Et on a une préfiguration de l'Ukraine à travers cette histoire. Donc on a aujourd'hui un problème, un problème qui est sémiotique, mais aussi un problème politique pour cet opéra. C'est un autre problème qui n'existait pas. Mais maintenant, il existe. Alors, eh bien, euh, on a en quelque sorte un opéra Ruslan et Yudmila qui, est, euh, qui concerne la sémiotique et qui va, évidemment, la sémiotique s'est intéressée au mythe à l'aspect la, à la, à à mythique de la Russie, de cet opéra, mais eh bien, aujourd'hui, ce qui est important, c'est le contexte de diffusion, de réception. Ce n'est pas simplement la partition des isotopies. Et la sémiotique doit s'intéresser à 
toutes les dimensions de l'œuvre, mais aussi au contexte de diffusion de réception. Et ce contexte nous met face aux dimensions politiques. C'est une des rares slides in, uh, in French. Et euh, nous avons sept, dans cet opéra, nous avons sept isotopies musicales. Cette isotopie musicale, c'est-à-dire effort. Nous avons euh, isotopie épique, nous avons isotopie euh, lyrique et euh, nous avons eh bien, isotopie fantastique, isotopie orientale, isotopie de l'amour, des bis isotopies et euh, des isotopies épico-fantastiques. Alors, eh bien, la euh, sémiotique eh s'est intéressée, évidemment, à euh, l'analyse de ces dimensions. Et euh, c'est la clé de la signification pour, en général, la euh, sémiotique narrative. Et ce qui se passe, c'est que au-delà de cette sémiotique, nous avons un discours. Nous avons un discours sur Ruslan et Lodmila qui relève de la part des Ukrainiens, de la part des Russes dans le futur, d'un espèce de storytelling. Un storytelling sur Ruslan et Lodmila. Qu'est-ce que c'est Eh bien, on va le voir et peut-être que la mise en scène, revenir, nous avons la mise en scène ici, The Staging, qui est à l'intersection entre la partition, The Score, et les contextes. Et donc, la mise en scène, c'est extrêmement important. C'est extrêmement décisif pour la signification. Alors, euh, on va, euh, je vais m'intéresser maintenant à la présentation d'abord de, euh, des isotopies. On a donc sept isotopies qui structurent Roussan et Ludmilla. On peut en faire euh, la liste et on peut voir qu'il y a une isotopie qui est dominante, c'est l'isotopie épique ou héroïque. Alors, on l'a, par exemple, tout de suite, dès le début, de l'ouverture. est un héros et on a toujours eh bien, ce début chez le bar hein, constamment et on l'a euh, à plusieurs reprises dans le, la partition toujours cette isotopie épique et on a eh bien, constamment euh, dans, euh, le, dans euh, la, euh, la partition la, la reprise d'un motif qui caractérise les dimensions épiques. Et ce qu'on a ensuite, c'est que, eh bien, constamment, on a une deuxième isotopie, eh bien, qui est l'isotopie lyrico populaire avec, par exemple, la cavatine de Lyudmila dans euh, l'acte euh, 1. On a aussi une fameuse isotopie fantastique avec la gamme parton de Tchernomor, 
hein, qui est fameux dans la musique euh, du 19e siècle. Euh, Blinka invente la gamme par ton pour montrer qu'il y a effectivement une rupture entre le monde normal et le monde des démons, qui est évidemment un monde différent sur le plan des tonalités. Donc, nous avons, si on passe en revue les isotopies, évidemment, nous avons les danses arabes, turques, les guiennes du Caucase à la cour de, de Tchernomor. On a encore l'isotopie de l'amour avec deux couples, Ratmir et Borislava, et aussi évidemment Ruslan et Ludmila. Et enfin, on a deux isotopies grotesques et fantastiques, hein, le rondeau de Farlap, par exemple, à la fin de, de, de l'acte 2, et une isotopie épico-fantastique hein, au début de l'acte 3. Alors, donc, nous avons, eh bien, euh, par exemple, de la possibilité de faire la liste de toutes les isotopies, par exemple, pour le premier acte, si on, on va faire l'analyse, on peut prendre toute la partition, l'étudier, hein, l'action, les personnages, le texte, les mesures, le caractère, les isotopies, les tonalités, les instruments. On peut faire tout ça. On a établi eh bien, une signification. Voilà, je le fais que pour l'acte 1 avec l'isotopie épique, l'irico-populaire, quand Ludmilla arrive. Ensuite, euh, l'Iroco populaire encore. Euh, euh, ensuite, euh, le final épique, fantastique, puis ensuite épique. Et on peut eh bien, montrer tout cela dans le premier acte. Bon. Alors, ce qui euh, se passe, eh bien, c'est que Rousselin et Ludmilla, c'est une mine d'or, golden mine pour la sémiotique. C'est merveilleux parce qu'on a les isotopies, on a aussi euh, des histoires, c'est-à-dire qu'on a le premier, l'épique isotope qui domine, l'isotopie épique qui domine. Dans l'acte 2, c'est l'isotopie épique qui domine encore. Dans l'acte 3, les isotopies de l'amour lyrique populaire fantastique et épique fantastique. Acte 4, le lyrique populaire, le grotesque fantastique, l'oriental et l'épique. Et nous avons, eh bien, à la fin, le retour de l'amour, du fantastique, du lyrique populaire et de l'épique. Alors, ce qu'on a... Eh bien, c'est qu'on a une séparation dans les isotopies. C'est-à-dire que Ruslan, évidemment, c'est l'isotopie épique. Le lyrique populaire, c'est Ludmila et Gorislava, ce sont des femmes. Et nous avons les isotopies de l'amour, le fantastique oriental, évidemment, pour d'autres personnages. Et nous avons... Eh bien, le grotesque hein, euh, qui s'exprime à travers le personnage de Farlaf. Donc, on a une structure extrêmement intéressante dans Ruslan qui nous met en fait en face d'une un, domination, d'un carré sémiotique qui nous ramène à l'épique et à l'épico-fantastique. Donc, cet opéra, finalement, nous revient revient à mettre en avant dans la musique eh bien, ce qui relève de l'épique et on, a, on tourne dans les tonalités, évidemment, on a des oppositions entre les tonalités qui sont extrêmement intéressantes. Alors, ce qui est intéressant maintenant, 
c'est de voir ce qui se passe non plus dans la partition, mais dans la mise en scène. Et la mise en scène, eh bien, on a un texte, la partition, le livret, bien sûr, mais cette mise en scène, c'est un autre texte. Je ne révèle rien de très nouveau, mais ce qui est intéressant, c'est que dans Rousselet et Bonilla, on va avoir deux interprétations différentes de l'œuvre et des isotopies à travers la mise en scène et deux conceptions politiques russes différentes. Alors, eh bien, la première, la première présentation, le, la première, c'est euh, la production du Marinsky de Valérie Gergiev, qui tout le monde sait que et bon, il a aujourd'hui un rôle politique en, en Russie important, de fait, dans ses fonctions. Et ce qui se passe, c'est que donc on a une volonté de respect du livre, respect de la partition. On reconstitue une Russie irréelle, fabuleuse. Hein. On a une espèce de show, de show magique. Eh bien, avec des changements de décor, des changements de euh, costume, des danseurs, des effets spéciaux. Alors, là, sorry. Lune Mila de Dieu à Kiev. Et nous avons finalement une conception, c'est que c'est le fabuleux, le conte fabuleux qui est la base de cette production, de cette mise en scène. Et en fait, le pro, la conception derrière tout cela, c'est le côté épique, l'isotopie épique qui est mise en valeur à travers la scène, mais c'est la virilité de Rousselin. C'est une conception très traditionnelle, une conception conventionnelle, une conception qui 
en fait, nous met en face du héros russe qui va vaincre toutes les difficultés pour gagner la main de Lyudmila. Donc, on a, euh, on a enfin une autre production russe aussi, c'est la production du Bolshoi de Tcherniakov. Dmitri Tcherniakov, et elle a été, c'est une production qui est intéressante parce qu'elle est politique. Pourquoi Parce que, eh bien, en 2011, il y a 11 ans, le Bolshoi ouvre à nouveau. Il est complètement rénové et pour la première, on donne eh bien, Roussin et Lumina. Pourquoi C'est un opéra du répertoire, c'est un opéra qui se termine bien, mais c'est un opéra qui permet une nouvelle mise en scène qui dit la modernité dans un, mo un opéra moderne, dans un Bolshoi théâtre moderne, il faut dire la modernité. Donc, on a l'intérêt de l'institution et un intérêt artistique parce que Tcherniakov relie les classiques de l'opéra. Il a fait, eh bien, il y a des différences très importantes. D'abord parce que l'action ne se passe plus dans la Russie médiévale, mais aujourd'hui. Et aujourd'hui, il y a 11 ans, c'est le temps où on pouvait critiquer les oligarques qui font une fête. Ils font une fête dans le théâtre du Bolshoi, ils font une fête et ils ne sont pas, des, sont pas des, des êtres du Moyen-Âge, mais des êtres de nos jours qui sont eh bien, euh, transformés. Nous avons un caméraman qui va les filmer. Et nous avons à voir aussi eh bien, la transformation des lieux, c'est-à-dire la grotte de film, c'est eh euh, la euh, salle de fête qui est déserte. Euh, nous avons un, euh, une espèce de bordel pour le château de Naïna et les jardins de Tchernomov. Tchernomov c'est une espèce de clinique. On ne sait pas très bien ce que c'est. Eh bien, euh, ce n'est pas une chambre de, de repos. C'est assez particulier. Alors là, on a par exemple, à l'ouverture, voilà tous les spectateurs, tous les gens de la fête qui vont applaudir l'orchestre. C'est le début. Et ensuite, on va les voir euh, faire la fête. Et il y a un caméraman qui est là, qui filme Rousselane et, et, et on voit sur l'écran Rousselane, c'est assez particulier. Alors, ce qui est intéressant, c'est que l'axe de l'opéra change à travers la mise en scène. C'est-à-dire qu'on a deux personnages au début qui apparaissent sur un écran, c'est Naïna, la sorcière, et euh, Finn, le, euh, le bon sorcier, et qui disent hein, « euh, euh, Love euh, doesn't euh, exist euh, » et euh, Finn répond « Oui, il oui, n'y a, euh, a pas d'Akajo, Tibier, Naïna. Hein. » mm -hmm. Donc, on est là dans euh, un autre axe de la mise en scène qui est euh, tout à fait intéressant. On voit, par exemple, l'acte 2, Finn, qui, donne la, qui explique à Rousselane ce qui se passe, et la sorcière Naïna est là, elle regarde, et Rousselane, ce n'est pas un héros, c'est un russe ordinaire qui a bon, des vêtements... Euh, très basique, et euh, il est intéressant, c'est que quand il va voir la tête, il est sur un champ de bataille. Il n'y 
y a des morts quand il va en prendre, quand il va combattre la tête. Et on voit que cette image, en 2011, elle s'inspire de guerres passées de la Russie, mais elle est très actuelle. Je ne fais pas d'autres commentaires. Et chez l'acte 3, on a cette espèce de Naïna, euh, Naïna le château Naïna, c'est une espèce de, de bordel, euh, on ne sait pas très bien euh, ce que c'est. Euh, L'acte 4, on a la clinique de euh, Yogmila, hein, euh, qui est à la fois un, un hôtel, une, une chambre d'hôpital, euh, on ne sait pas très bien ce que c'est. Et euh, on a non pas des danses orientales, mais des pâtissiers qui, qui, qui dansent. C'est tout à fait singulier. Alors, quand on revient eh bien, à la fin de l'opéra, on a, euh, je passe au Rousselane qui, qui ne se bat pas contre Chernomor, on a la fin de l'opéra, ce sont les deux le couple Roslan et Ludmilla qui se retrouvent. Alors, eh bien, qu'est-ce qu'on a dans cette production, finalement Un changement d'isotopie. C'est-à-dire que ce n'est plus la, la guerre, ce n'est plus l'héroïsme, mais c'est l'amour. C'est l'amour. Et on a, dans cette... Euh, Production, l'histoire d'un russe ordinaire, en quelque sorte, Ruslan, qui va devenir eh bien, le héros par euh, hasard. Et donc, nous avons un changement d'axe de l'opéra et qui est tout à fait intéressant. Et donc, ce qu'on peut dire, c'est que on voit qu'il y a une critique artistique de la société russe en 2011, par un russe talentueux, par Tcherniakov. On a deux oppositions à l'intérieur de, de, euh, de tout ceci. Et donc, ce qu'on a, c'est un opéra extrêmement sensible qui, en fait, aujourd'hui, va devenir quelque chose d'absolument intéressant en Russie, à l'étranger, pour voir, non pas la représentation d'une histoire, mais pour voir eh bien, comment on va avoir un opéra qui parle du présent, de la société, des conflits, de la politique, et non pas du passé. On peut dire que c'est fini, il y a une histoire de, de Rousselane, qui est modifié par l'évolution de la société, l'évolution du contexte politique. Cette communication très intéressante. Thank you very much, Robert. Yes. Excuse me, excuse, excuse me. I, I don't know if you can hear me. Oh, oh, we have someone coming in through Zoom. Yes. Oh, Marta, greetings. Uh, Uh, I'm sorry, I, I, I would like to say thank you to, to Jean-Marie Jacono because I think that it is a very, very important um, communication. N nothing else. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fanta. Thank you. For thank you. Congratulations for you. And stay here. Bye bye tomorrow. Today. today. <laughs> And stay here for reactions to other questions. Any questions? Uh, merci pour votre question. Très clair, So, um, what was the official reception of the 2011 uh, production? Good question. 
uh, it's <laughs> it's uh, my following topic. Maybe Bolshoi is state funded, I think. Yeah. Sorry, Bolshoi is it's state uh, funded. Yes, yes. 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 So there is a, a close connection to the yeah. political program, of course. You know, share like in France in the, the, the 19th century, there was a close connection mm -hmm. between the, the opera and the political and French program. Yeah, of course. And of course, at that time, we, Ten days uh, ago, uh, there was very, something very interesting in uh, the Russian opera. For instance, there was a production of Boris Godunov in Saint Petersburg by Mariinsky Theater with uh, uh, the, the director was Han Wick, Dick, who passed away uh, last year. And uh, it was a uh, critical of the oligarchs. And Boris Godunov was a kind of mafioso. Uh, Tracksuit. Yes, yes. <laughs> mafioso and uh, the simpleton uh, was wearing a t shirt with Superman. Basic. Yeah. Like that. And, uh, <laughs> and it's very interesting because they have seen Battle 12, 20, 2012, just of the following year. And as I can, Every, the possibilities of critic of uh, to have a critical production was possible. No, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I was in Moscow uh, uh, five years ago, and uh, I was at Bolshoi, and uh, I was very surprised because at the Bolshoi Theatre uh, there was a production of Boris Godunov. The premiere was uh, had. Uh, the problem was in the 1948. Oh my God! Very modern. Stalinist. The traditional Bolshoi production was very disappointing. But of course, in in Russia, you are talented director, yeah. right? talented politician. Yeah. But what is possible to say? Mm -hmm. Of course, mm -hmm. I, have, I suppose we will have uh, aerial productions. Mm -hmm. I like the, the hero, the Russian hero, Russian uh, symbols, uh, not, uh, of course, not. I wonder if uh, uh, international production would be possible. Yeah. Ten days ago, yes. Ten uh, years ago, yes. <laughs> I wonder if it's very much in this context of European directors who have the freedom and more power even than the conductors to go their own way. We see all this in Germany for the past 30 years, and it's happening now for Russia. It may or may not hold all of the ideological content. Yes, it yes, may yes, just yes. be a matter of a, a new episode. This choice. Single ticket might not be not so to have as to deal with this. Yes. But I think your isotope is in the possibility of seeing how we can analyze these different productions is the key. Mm -hmm. So we're getting set up for our last presentation and we're on time. This is good. Um, I met Osamu yesterday, I think, in one of the sessions. Uh, Osamu Tomori from Kunitatsu College of Music in Japan. <coughs> He's going to also be speaking on this topic. Paratextual approaches to the musical signification and narratives in Anne de Pergrenage, Premier Anne, Suisse. So, what was missing from that was what you spoke about. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And now we see the other pieces that, that were made. That made it. <laughs> that made it. You know, we just went ahead here. Thanks to everyone for staying within the time that we were able to catch up with the 10 minutes that we lost at the beginning. Actually, for those of you who are going on the tour, at six o'clock <laughs> is to the Palau de Musica. We get the registration desk before the well. Yes, yes, yes.
Thank you so much, Lydia. <laughs> He's committed a flash drive. Yes. Okay, I've got a flash drive. Now. That would help. It won't work. The wrong size. I don't have an adapter for your computer. Yeah, that, that was your name there. Oh, you just mail it. That's easy. Yes. So moving this PowerPoint from one computer to another. <laughs> And the same issue getting locked out of uh, Google. I mean, it's good because it means you can't be an app, but it's very limited to people. First, you can probably put you know, a phone that works in the same spot. Put it on the last one. Yeah. So I can do it. Yeah. Electronic, and then we'll take far more 
¿Dormiste? ¿Dormiste tú? ¿Con los dibujos de Sofía? ¿A que dice el Simon? ¿Lo viste? Estoy. Estoy abrigado así, ¿eh? Es una cosa... ¿Y sigues? No, no, siento más ninguno. Un poco de cajera aquí nada más. Pero es caput. Ah, Sofía tiene ojitos. Sí, eso está un poco estafado porque es de lo que se te rompió. He cogido esa mitad. Ah, vale. Muchas gracias. Okay. Oh, oh. 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 So my material my subject, my material subject. Oh, microphone, okay. If you speak a little bit louder. Yes. My material subject today is année de pèlerinage, première année Suisse, of France. It may be an old story as a musical musical subject, particularly when it comes to epigraphs. But I hope I can contribute and advance the research even, even little bit. In fact, this work is well known for its use of epigraph to almost every piece, with two exceptions. Oh, okay. uh, let's have a quick look through to recall them. I cited the music. I cited the partition from Noye. Uh, list of the Gabe, the Capital Best Edition. Okay, go ahead. Huh? Yes. Okay, okay. So, so please, no epigraph, both pay. And uh, large, there's a long, uh, three epigraph. I don't know. Okay, okay. Uh, epigraph. And very long epigraph. And is it fun? So it's good. Oh, okay. So, PP, you have an example? Which? No, it's okay. Okay, okay. Right. So, uh, before beginning to talk my research, first let's deal with the issue of the different edition briefly. And then pairing out for me on this two versions. The first version, I will call it the 1841 edition version. The second revised version, the 1855 version. The 1841 version has two different editions. Go ahead. Uh, ratio edition Paris. 1943 Hasling edition Vienna. <coughs> Between two editions, there are only minor differences, numbering of the pieces and overall title. Okay. Hmm. 
between two uh, between two edits of the k. I can then. I like to call attention to one simple fact. The first version is called often Algam Voyager, according to the 1842 Hasselinga edition, to distinguish from it from distinguish from the second version and the Germanic version. But this habit is misleading. The first version is called already Premier Anne Germanic Swiss in the 1841 Richel edition. Uh, there is a shame of organization of the two works. Uh, I can not get into detail. Okay. By position, there is a good deal of difference between 1841 version and 1848 version. Four cases added pastoral, orage, epilogue, the month of the two pieces are withdrawn, Lyon, Ed, and so. Organization ordering is modified. Revision work is done to many pieces, some pieces uh, uh, greatly revised. Having these basic data confirmed, let me restate the issue raised in the beginning. beginning. Do we really seriously, do, uh, do we really take seriously enough the importance of these epigrams? Yes or no? Yes, but uh, when regular textual studies are done by the uh, crew, 1992. For the other hand, on the other hand, the scholarly information is not always consulted, particularly in popular research. Uh, and another problem is we musicologists know that the epigraph to each piece is a variable source of signification analysis, but have we exploited exploited them fully? And when it comes to the paratext elements. And the epigraph is one paratext element, paratext element among others. Here is the paratext element according to unit, which we discuss in detail in the pioneering book. In many, in my opinion, systematic and detailed analysis of these paratext elements is still. Need, needed for better understanding of this work. Let's begin with the preface. Jeanette mentioned uh, the existence of a preface in this work as an example of the fact that artistic work, other than literary text, literary, literary, literary text, can have a preface. Here, the preface. To 1841, which the edition, photo reprinted in the of the first edition to 2007. The text formulated this is this the text formulated this is epic, well before his famous Harold essay published in 1855. But the preface to the 1841 visual edition was known to a very limited number of musicologists before this photo reprinted in 2007. The version generally known was the preface to 1840 to Hasselinger edition through transcription right of held the front list medical edition 1916. But five additional paragraphs in 1842 version, circumstantial in nature, obscure the logical clarity of 1841 version. In my opinion, this may have led to a poor reception of this text. I'm preparing another paper for this program. Now, let me present a few. Cases, case example for extended analysis by, by a textual element. The first one, the first piece of cycle, Chapelle Guillaume Their motto is in one line, Aina fe alle, alle fe aine. No problem, it seems, but it's not so easy in this research. This motto has been often erroneously attributed to Schiller. Crow pointed out this error. Uh, and, uh, and refer to uh, Alexander Dima and to biblical sources. But where the expression exact in German comes from? I think uh, I'm going to identify this source, but it's very important today. Uh, the motto has a function to a high, 
This motto has a function to highlight social and political meaning of this piece. The name of the legacy, Victor Shalai, committed in 85 and 55 version, politician famous for the Christianism, reinforcing this message. In any case, even with this figure, political implications sufficient to convey to the audience through historical facts legend concerning Guillaume Taylor and Shiraz drama. It was natural that in 1855 version, this piece took the position of Leon after the letter was withdrawn from that time. Have a look at another kind of architectural element, picture of a cover page. Okay. Here are the cover page of two editions. They are draw, there are drawings of William Tell's temple with landscape around them in real life. In real life, uh, no, in real life, is that right? Uh, I painting realized in the mid middle of the 19th century. There are visual representation of landscape. They are visual representations of landscape, really. But in fact, it is more than that. It makes us understand the uh, physical relationship between the author his, and the subject of the work, Chapelle de Guillaume Tell. Here's another source. One of the travel guides. Uh, one of the travel guides of Swiss. The one, this one was published in 1824 and re edited several times. Rest and Marie Dadou probably consulted this guidebook before and the middle of the travel. Uh, we find it, Maria. Um, a Mary diary, similar passages from this book. Mary wrote in the 1970s as follows. We had made no plans, neither France nor I. We didn't decide it to the itinerary or anything about. It was an accident that sent us to Switzerland. It didn't matter where we went. As we know, and I believe it is not true. Before their departure, the lecture of Senancourt Oberman Six passages in the child of the pilgrimage motivated them greatly. Besides, they had a travel guidebook. This guidebook has a chapter called Out of Pelvinage à la Chapelle de Terre in four pages. Pelvinage at the moment. It includes the legend of the tale, tale his heroic feat taking place here when, when William Tell was taken by water to bring on the lake, he was left to steer the Caught in a storm and jumped back to the shore, etc. Et of all evidence, Rest and Mary approached the temple on board. It is also confirmed by the diaries and the cover page of the partition describes the situation. We can imagine the perspective of those who are on that boat. Huh? The boat. Uh, this perspective in movement may correspond to the musical event at the beginning of the piece. No. No. Oh. No, no. You can try it. Not a PPG, but uh, you need to download PDF file. Download. Is it just you want? I, I can play that if that's all it is. <laughs> just that. <laughs> you want to just play that? Or yeah. Okay. <laughs> Let me jump to the middle part of this ternary reform piece. Okay. The middle part has a typical orage, stone puppet, shifting to victory. 
this part seems to have double legends and double meanings. We know it seem, seems about 12 legends that need to evolve and it evolve, evolve political emotion. The second meaning I've got, I've got from my previous research is that of a personal experience. Very strong word. Not in the world, some of the critics, 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 uh, for that. We know since long time, Mary, uh, we know since long time, married memory and diary. But there are still some published parts in parts. In 20, uh, 2007, Charles Dipeche published an unpublished part of the memoir concerning the voyage and studies. It was written a little after the installation in Geneva in July 1837, the second half of 1837 or in the spot of 1838. So at the period where the memory is hot and years before their breakup. Here in the passage, narrated their stone experience. So this is very long, so some, some part of it. Excellent. Et, en français, notre petit parc s'arrêta les bords du Burkina. Nous étions encore en ville du Rocher et la Chapelle. Un violent orage s'annonçant dans le ciel. Les ondes agitées d'abord par un léger frémissement se sillonnèrent de plus en plus et se soulèvent bientôt en vague menaçante. Les eaux changèrent de couleur. Et toutes ces niches harmonies de la tempête et pendant que mon corps chancelait à toute dérosillation de notre pauvre barre d'utilité par la vague à la vague. Et nous avons plus forte que toutes les autres, nous ayons pris un travers nous fit perdre pied en faillite en renversée lorsque je me sentis tout à la fois fortement étreinte et doucement attirée par un bras qui s'enlaçait autour de mon sentier. Marie. Nous dit une voix bien connue. Je continue ici. Two pages. Very <laughs> It It is certain that the story is very romant uh, romanticized, but we have no reason to doubt the authenticity of this account. At last, so hard to, to them, it was reality, even if only psychic levels. I, I, uh, I think this account may serve. Also, as a paratext to Orage in South in 1855. Prajin, after the author shifted to the beginning of the cycle, Orage has no implication, political implication, on, uh, like, unlike the author, and can evoke merely personal emotion. Separated by the political meaning, it is this sentimentally purified, sentimentally purified version of the scene of Orage described here. The second piece. I have to be brief. At first, it concerns a lecture of epigraph quoted from Byron, Child Harold. The passage quoted in four first lines of Hunter 85. You see something omitted in the first lines. Some uh, in first right. The, mo the motif of mission clear. It says clear, placid, lemon. So it is not a poem of like Wallenstadt, but like lemon. So probably they were so eager before the arrival, arrival even before the travel, the view of the Wallenstadt provokes something very there's something they are longing for, longing for. It was lemon for them, it was lemon for them one month before their arrival to the real lemon. The following canto, canto 86. Canto 86 is a beautiful paratext to the musical piece. Their breasts are living fragrance from the shore of flowers, it freshly childhood on the year 
drops a, drops a light trick of the suspended form. I have the impression that I can share the same towards the end of the piece. Here is the edition they read. Here is the edition they read. Uh, year before the, uh, they, they read, one year before the departure at least. We can identify thanks to the passage quoted from, by Mary from this version in a letter to the list, in a list, May 1835. We have also a passage from Mary's memoir that can serve a pretext. Uh, I think this serves as a to uh, uh, the projects for the harmony of uh, the uh, So the third particular case in presentation concerns epigraph quoted from Shira's poem. In Zoyenda, thousand thousand accused, the beginning is speed there in human nature. In the way for includes young nature between Hakim. Where do these three lines of Shiva come from? Research is simple, you type in Hebrew. The answer is from poem called Flichtering, Flichtering the Fugitive, or the motivation of the poem, for the poem. Why these particular three lines from this long poem? This is a poem. Uh, one answer is because it is a description of a water spring. But there may be other, another important reason, a musical intertextuality. Shiva set the music to be formed. It was written uh, for Christian music. But it is highly probable that this ground of the poem not directly from Schiller's writing, but from Schubert's leader set to this poem. Schubert means to represent a high form. Schubert's music presents a highly dramatic development following the poem. Music set to these three, but music set to these three measures a particular trait contrasting the rest of the lead. Simple melody line, simple texture with repetition between two notes on the half, uh, on half note bass with a contrast So uh, I will contrast it again to the rest of the piece. You at least me can call it marked section rhythmic resemblance between the whole piece of over June six and this three major passage. This is no accident I will do. It is something they figure out. We can notice this hidden intertextuality. So I have to finish. So uh, Shep, 
Donc, euh, this is film. The epigraph comes from Shiva's, uh, Shiva text, out text Shiva reads, and in the intersexual relationship Shiva reads, and uh, as stylistic quotation. Okay, every, every case is different, so I just sort of three, four, five, six, so I have to continue. <laughs> 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 <laughs>